She said two Big Macs, two fish fillets. No, 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 no. She said two Big Mac. No, no, no. She said two Big Macs, two fish fillets. No, that's not it. I need a tinfoil hat. What do you think, Ellen? Hey Earthlings, welcome to Cloud Shadow TV. My name is Jessie. This is episode one of the Alien Abduction Support Group. I am your host. Here at the Alien Support Group, we talk about aliens. We are believers. We are gonna get into the thick of it. But today, we're talking about our first case, which is the disappearance of Frederick Fountage, who was an Australian fellow. He was a pilot in Australia. He was on a solo flight and he disappeared mysteriously his last words being, it's hovering and it's not an aircraft. And we're gonna get into what happened to him, the actual incident, who he was, and then some theories surrounding it. And you know, why I believe aliens were involved. If you wanna be a part of the Alien Abduction Support Group, please like and subscribe and keep watching this video. I hope you enjoy. Oh, and this is Alan, my alien. He's a, he's here for support, he's my, um, in-person supportee. He's been abducted by aliens too. It was a different type of aliens than his alien. Traumatizing though. He doesn't want to talk about it. So maybe another video. Sorry. Alan. He's telling me to shut up. He only speaks telepathically. So let's get straight to it. Frederick Valentich was born on June 9th, 1958. So he's a Gemini like me. <laughs> His parents were named Guido and Alberta Valentich, and Alberta actually didn't speak English. They were Italian immigrants, and Guido spoke good English, but I guess Alberta didn't, so she wasn't really interviewed in the report or seen in any interviews. So if you're wondering why is his mom never mentioned, um, I think that's why she didn't speak English, so they didn't really interview her. Maybe they did somewhere in Italy. I don't know if anybody knows. Let me know in the comments. and. Uh, this is my first YouTube video, so like and subscribe if you like it. It would definitely help motivate more videos like this. And we need community members in the alien abduction support group. So, anyways, back to Fred. He was the oldest of four children. He, at the time when this happened, which was in 1978, he had a 12-year-old brother and two twin sisters who were three, Lara and Olivia. And I'm pretty sure that they primarily spoke Italian as well and they spoke Italian in the household. Although he did get a C in Italian in high school, which not to bring up his high school grades, like I don't care, but it is important to the story because I guess his intelligence and how good of a pilot he is became in question when he had this accident or disappearance. We're not exactly sure what happened. That will be up to you to decide what you think as you watch the video. He, he had a girlfriend who was named Rhonda Rushton. She was 17 years old and Fred was 20. So people give Fred a hard time a lot because like of the wrong things. I think this is the weirdest thing about Fred is that he had a 17 year old girlfriend and he was 20. Like three years is not a bad age difference when you're like 20 and 23. I don't know, maybe they were on more of the same life path time in 1978 in Australia. I don't know what the age rules are there, but little, a little suspicious Fred <laughs> um, but yeah I think people really give Fred a hard time about like the wrong things and I think overall Fred was like a really determined strong interesting person who definitely deserves like to be taken seriously so he also had a best friend whose name was Gregory and they met at the air training corps because Fred's dream was to be a pilot at first he wanted to be a part of the Royal Australian Air Force but he didn't get in um, and so his new goal was to become a commercial pilot and so he was in the process of trying to get his commercial pilot license although he was struggling a little bit to pass the test and that's something that we're going to talk about. Fred was from Avondale Heights which is like a suburb of Melbourne, Australia which I heard is called Melbourne to Australians but um, I'm American, so I'm going to say Melbourne because I feel funny saying Melbourne. Fred went to Keeler Heights High School, and he wasn't the best student. He had an A and PE, but other than that, he mostly got C's and D's, and he actually failed math. Like I said, I don't care about his 
grades, but it's sort of important to the story. He was said to be quiet until you got to know him, but he was thought of well by his friends and family. Fred was a shop assistant at an army disposal store. He lived with his parents and he was said to be um, like a good kid. He did the duties he was supposed to do around the house and he helped out with his little sister, which was also brought up by his mentor, who was a guy named Robert Barnes. I think he was a instructor or a teacher at the school where he went to to get his commercial pilot license. He would um, have one-on-one -on -one lessons with Fred at his home on Sundays and a lot of times Fred would bring his little sisters and um, Mr. Barnes was, he said that Fred took really good care of them and was always attentive to, attentive to them but he was also like doing his assignment and his work so um, he was a good brother. <laughs> Something interesting about Fred is that he was a really big eater. Um, on the day of his disappearance he apparently went to McDonald's so they asked his girlfriend Rhonda Rushton what his typical order would be and this is what she said. Two Big Macs, two cheeseburgers, one fish filet, and chips, which I believe is fries. Um, but I'm not sure because it's Australia, not England. Do you guys call fries chips? One thing his friend Greg said about him was that he was the type of person who would call the police if he knew that anyone had drugs or was doing drugs, which is kind of funny. Um, he was like a, he was like a boy next door type of guy. He wouldn't do drugs, you know, drugs are bad. And Fred was actually afraid of water and not a strong swimmer, so whenever he had a flight over the ocean, because, you know, he lived in Australia, he would fly wearing his life jacket already, which I just think is kind of interesting that a pilot would be so afraid of water that they are always wearing their life jacket, but, you know, he was safe. He was prepared and this kid like did not give up as we're going to talk about and I think that's the thing I like best about Fred or Frederick is that like he really just tried to do everything he could to make what he wanted happen which you know we should all learn from Fred about that. So like he didn't really do drugs Fred was also said to only drink two alcoholic beverages at a time. Um, he would never drink before flying and he wouldn't drink the day before flying either. So that's, you know, how you want your pilot to be, honestly. <laughs> you don't want a drunk pilot. Fred was raised Catholic, but he didn't really go to church that often, except for on holidays and special occasions. And he was chosen to be a flight instructor in the near future, which was something I'm sure that he was really looking forward to. Something to keep in mind for some of the theories about what happened to him. And then I just kind of wanted to talk about Melbourne at the time, because um, this was 1978. It's been a little bit since then, so let's kind of set ourselves in the time zone. So in, in Australia, there had only been color TV for three years, and also the current population was 14 million, which for the entire like continent of Australia, that is not very many people. It was also a newly conservative government in Australia at the time, but something to note is that UFOs were like in the cultural zeitgeist, they were a phenomenon at the time, everyone was talking about UFOs. I think Star Wars had just come out recently, also Close Encounters of the Third Kind, UFOs were a huge part of like what people were talking about and interested in the time so it wasn't like weird to think about the possibility of UFOs or aliens. Fred and Rhonda had been dating for a few months and earlier in that October, this happened in late October, this incident happened on October 21st but earlier in October Fred had given, actually given Rhonda a friendship ring, which I looked up is like a pre-engagement ring or a promise ring. She had actually considered this a little strange because their five month anniversary would have been October 20th um, and he gave it to her before that. So the last time Rhonda and Fred hung out was actually on October 20th, not October 21st. But interesting, interestingly, Rhonda didn't really mention that it was their anniversary. Um, in regards to them hanging out that night. She said that Fred had even almost forgotten that they were supposed to go out that night and the next night on Saturday when he was ha had this plan to fly his solo trip to King Island. And so basically he just like couldn't go on the date that Rhonda was expecting. So they pushed the time back to I think 7.30 but still this was a time that Fred never could have actually made which is c something to keep in mind. They made the plans to meet after and she had told Fred to bring a pair of extra clothes so that she he could just go straight to her 
for their date after he got back from the flight and um, those clothes were not found in his car after he disappeared. Rhonda also claimed that when Fred was really nervous he would sweat profusely and she said that on October 20th he was sweating but he didn't really say anything that was bothering him. Maybe I think it had something to do with the fact that it was their month anniversary and they weren't really doing anything. Maybe he was nervous about getting his commercial pilot license. He had another test to take in November and he had already failed a few times so this was very this was very important to him becoming a commercial pilot so I'm sure he was very focused on that. And Rhonda described Fred as not having very many people to share his problems with and so what he would do is he would hold them in his mind and that he held them as a list and when he had worked out a situation he would mentally cross it off. Also when people talk about the Frederick Valentich situation they like to say that he was UFO obsessed but I really don't see that as the case. So like I said before UFOs were like a big part of the cultural zeitgeist at the time. Excuse me my camera died. I had to go get a new battery. I'm like really understanding how much work goes into YouTube videos. Sheesh, it's way more than I thought. Yesterday I recorded a whole video and then I realized I didn't have my microphone. So I'm doing it again with my microphone. Anyways, where was I? And a book called Chariot of the Gods had just came out and Fred was interested in it. He like had seen that movie and read the book, but he wasn't obsessed. And that was repeated by multiple family members and friends. He had like a average level of interest in UFOs. Although these interests were reignited when he was working with the Royal Australian Air Force, he was actually allowed to see classified UFO documents and this kind of like intrigued him and scared him and he even said to his dad that he was worried about attacks from UFOs and his dad told him that that was not something that would happen and not to worry about it. He also believes that he saw a UFO once. His mom actually saw it first and then called him out to see it. The direct quote from the report says, his mother saw a UFO one night. She called Fred and he saw it too. It was a large light, 10 times larger than a star, was stationary for a while, and then moved off at a great speed. This happened about eight months ago. And then the last little tidbit about UFOs in Fred's life was that on October 15th, which was pretty close to when this happened, Fred had said to Rondo, if a UFO landed in front of me right now, I would go in it, but never without you. How sweet. <laughs> but Rhonda said it was a passing comment and he didn't bring up UFOs or aliens again for the rest of the night. So she didn't consider him alien obsessed. So I don't really think the public should either if the people in his life didn't. Uh, I think that's cute and funny. I would love it if somebody said that to me. <laughs> Fred was an air training cadet as a boy. When he did not make it into the Royal Australian Air Force because he had very low scores and they actually labeled him as only fit for unskilled work. Rude. He actually came back as a free civilian worker unpaid because he wanted to be a part of it and eventually he was given the rank of airman. So that's how he probably was able to see those confidential confidential files and you know another reason why he was just a really determined person yeah he didn't get in but he came back and he worked for them for free until he got what he wanted something we can look back at now with like a modern lens that it's very likely that Fred had ADHD or ADD or even maybe dyslexia um, because he was said to be a bad speller and he was a bad test taker his mentor, Robert Barnes, described him as impatient but smart enough to pass the test. So I think that says a lot about like, you know, how times have changed and I don't think that his testing and school scores have as much to do with his intelligence as a lot of people try to like weigh it with. Fred's pilot logbook was lost and that's what like says how many hours he has been in the air as a pilot. And so we don't know the exact amount of hours, but we know that he had at least 150. So that's what the number that people mostly use. Now you needed 147 miles to have the certification level that he had in order to fly at night in clear weather, which is called a class four instrumental rating. He had the ranking where he could fly in a clear night, but he couldn't fly if there was bad weather at night. 
But like I said, it was known that he had flown at least 150 hours, but on some paperwork that I saw, he, I think that came from, yeah, that came from October 7th, he had 160 flight hours. So he maybe had a little bit more than 150 hours, but like the safe number to say is 150 hours. So like I said, he went out of his way to meet up with Robert Barnes to get the um, one-on-one lessons and he went back to the Air Force to get this um, ranking as airman eventually because he went back as an unpaid f- civilian. He was very, very determined. Another thing I just want to say to prove that point is some of the amounts of times he took tests until he passed them. So there are tests that he did pass. He had another test to take. I think it would have been his fourth attempt to take the commercial pilot license test in November and remember this incident happened in October. I fully believe that he intended to take that test. But let me just let you know some of these tests that he did actually pass. He passed basic aeronautical knowledge on his third attempt. He passed his restricted private pilot on his second attempt. He did something called a PPL theory exam. I don't exactly know what that is, but there was a section called nav, navigation, and he passed that on his second attempt, and then there was a section called MET, and he actually att- he passed MET on his first attempt. Then there was aircraft performance and operation, which he passed on his fifth attempt, but he kept trying. He just did not give up, and I like, I appreciate that about Fred. We gotta give Fred his flowers. He did not give up. He was a determined dude. Finally, he passed air legislation on his third attempt. So, go Fred. He just really didn't give up. I like that about him. But... He did kind of lie sometimes, which we all lie. He was a human, okay? Just because someone dies doesn't make them perfect. And, you know, Fred lied a few times. Not great, but I think we can forgive him over 30 years later. (laughs) So he had told multiple people that he actually passed that CPL commercial pilot license exam and he hadn't. And a lot of people actually only found that out after his disappearance. And this included Robert Barnes, who was his mentor. And that kind of made him question his trust of Fred. But I don't think it was, I think it was more he was embarrassed and he was determined to pass it. So he thought, oh, it doesn't matter if I lie, I'm going to pass it eventually. Don't think like that. (laughs) And then he had actually originally lied to Rhonda about passing some tests, but a few months into their relationship, he told her the truth. Like I said before, he had made that plan for a date with Rhonda where she asked him to leave her a change of clothes in the car. He had also told his dad that he would be home at 11, 10 or 11 p.m., which aligns better with his flight plan. So it would make sense that if he was telling his dad that, he would, his plan was to fly to King Island, come back, and then go straight home. But he also led Rhonda to believe that they were going on a date. Which, the time he said, 7.30 p.m., wasn't possible because I think he was supposed to land in King Island around that time, so he wouldn't be only halfway done with his flight. And his friend Gregory had said that typically if he was going to miss plans or be late, he would call ahead of time. The actual day of the incident, what happened? Fred woke up at home and then he went to his job as a shop assistant where he got finished around noon. From there he went to a meteorology class and after this it's assumed that he went to McDonald's for that like rather large meal I mentioned earlier. Then he headed off to the Melbourne Moorabbin Airport where he brought four life jackets with him and he actually told the staff there at Moorabbin that he was going to pick up passengers. But here's another little lie. He had told his girlfriend and other people that he was going to pick up crayfish, which are similar to lobster. I guess they're like the Australian version of lobster. Fancy, delicious, going to King Island to get some lobster. But wait, you're not allowed to fly with lobster back on a plane. So it's very possible that he just was like making up the story about the passengers to the people that work there because He knew he was going to get a crayfish, and oh no no, you're not allowed to bring a crayfish on the plane. So he was being a little bit of a bad boy. Hmm, Frederick. Hmm. Fred's flight plan was a 125 nautical mile trip from the Melbourne Moorabbin Airport to King Island, but he would stop about halfway and turn at Cape Otway. 
The weather was extremely clear that night, which means he had the clearance to fly. And he flew a Cessna 182L, which is a four-seater plane, and it has the ability to attach two car seats for children. It's not a seaplane, meaning it's not meant to land in the water, and it only has one engine. The particular Cessna that Fred was renting that night had just had its 100-hour inspection the day before his flight. What actually happened? What was this incident? Let's get in. Let's dig in deep here. Now, the... The actual incident is actually pretty short, what actually happened, but um, I'm going to like tell you a step-by-step -step guide of what happened, and then I'm actually going to just read the report of the, what they said to each other, because there are recordings of it, but they're like with heavy Australian accents, which sometimes are a little harder to understand, so I noticed people just like repeat it afterwards. So I'm just going to go ahead and read it, you know, like and subscribe if you like it. <laughs> At 6.10 p.m., Fred is sitting on the plane while his gas is getting topped off. He gets enough gas to go 300 miles, which is a lot farther than his trip. At 6.19 p.m., he takes off. Once he's in the air, Fred makes contact with the Melbourne Flight Service Unit, which I will probably be refer referring to as FSU. At 7 o'clock p.m., he radios in and says that he's made it to his turning point of Cape Otway. It's only six minutes later at 7.06 p.m. when he calls in and asks if there are any other aircraft in the area. Something that he first identifies as an aircraft is orbiting around him and he even says it seems like it's toying with him. He says that it's long, shiny, and metallic and he sees something that he at first mistakes as landing lights. Over the next six minutes, he's in contact with the FSU. He repeats that the aircraft is really messing with him, but he seems very matter-of-fact and calm, like he's not overreacting or freaking out to the situation as a pilot should. At 7.12 p.m., he begins to have engine problems, um, describing it as a coughing noise. Then there's a strange metallic noise, like a, like a clinging clicking sound and the transmission cuts off. Rest in peace, Fred. So, like I said, the original tape is um, not out there. It's never been found. Apparently, they gave a copy of it to his dad, Guido. But as far as the public is concerned, um, we don't have the actual tape. So, I'm going to just, like I said, read the transcript. So, when I'm over here, like this, I'm Fred. When I'm over here, I'm Steve Roby, the FSU guy. So, Steve, Fred, and then I guess the little in-between parts I'll be in the middle. <laughs> Here goes nothing. All right, and I think that's a good place to stop for part one. I'm going to get into part two. This is my first video. I don't want to, like, stuff my voice down your guys' throat for too long, so we're going to go ahead and stop it here, and we'll pick back up with the part two. I hope you enjoyed. Please watch and subscribe. Thank you for watching. I mean, please like and subscribe. Thank you for watching. I'm new at this. I'm still getting the lingo down. I appreciate y'all. I'm Jesse. This is Cloud Shadow TV. You've been watching the Alien Abduction Support Group where we support Fred. We support all the people who believe in aliens. This is Alan, my alien. We're supportive. We love you. We love aliens. We love everyone yay like and subscribe earthlings please come back for part two it'll be here sooner than you know we're gonna get right into it i appreciate you leave likes and comments and subscriptions i come in peace bye peace <laughs> we come in peace out oh that was a dad joke